Welcome to Guldfajen and this introduction pre-performance talk. Uh, my name is Katarina Aronsson. I'm dramaturg and head of programming in this house, the Royal Swedish Opera. And besides me stands Barry Millington. I'm very happy to have you here again because you, you, you came on Thursday and talked about the Valkyrie. And now you will talk about Siegfried because Siegfried will begin in one hour. Uh, just a few words about you. You have written eight books about Wagner uh, and you have, you have also written the articles about Wagner and his operas in the Groves New Dictionary of Music and Musicians. You founded and you are also editor of the Wagner Journal in England. Yeah. Yes. And uh, what else? Uh, you are also music chief music critic at the Evening Standard in London. Right. We are so happy to have you here. And Thank please, I, I leave the word to you. Thank you very much, Katarina. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, having on Thursday night seen Wotan in this production well and truly snookered by Fricka, and his son Siegmund killed by Hunding, except of course in this production um, we didn't actually see him killed, but we now come to Wotan's grandson Siegfried and what I call the Siegfried problem. How are we to understand Siegfried? Ernest Newman described him as an overgrown boy, boy scout. Robert Gutmann as a hooligan. Adorno as a bully boy, incorrigible in his naivety, imperialistic in his bearing. Thomas Mann, uh, slight technical hitch. <laughs> Not the second. Thank you very much, Simon. Thomas Mann reminds us that Wagner was captivated by a puppet show he witnessed one day. Hasn't it occurred to anybody, Mann said, that this Siegfried bears a striking resemblance to the little fellow who wields the slapstick in the fairground booth? Well, Martin Geck suggests that the figure of Siegfried changes through the last two operas of the cycle. Whereas initially he was the youthful and carefree fairy tale hero, fearlessly thrusting aside all his enemies and once hailed as the freest of the free, he eventually turns into a tragic hero driven to his death in the tradition of classical tragedy, incurring guilt through no fault of his own. Michael Hall, however, maintains that Siegfried meets his downfall without ever truly understanding his fate. He is a hero who fails to attain tragedy. So what's the truth about Siegfried? Well, we could do worse than begin by asking what Wagner himself said about him. Now, Wagner conceived of Siegfried as a free hero one who would be untrammeled by the compromises made by his grandfather Wotan. Brave and fearless, he was described by Wagner as the most highly developed and complete human being I can conceive of. Elsewhere, he called him man in the most natural, sunny fullness of his physical manifestation, the male embodied spirit of the one eternal creative purpose, the doer of real deeds, filled with supreme naked power and indisputable charm. Charm, not the first attribute that springs to my mind when I hear the name Siegfried, I confess. Thomas Mann again describes him as the mythical figure of light, bounded and restricted by nothing, man unprotected, totally self-reliant and self-sufficient, resplendent in freedom, the fearlessly innocent doer of deeds and fulfiller of destiny, who through the sublime natural phenomenon of his death heralds the twilight of old and outmoded world forces and redeems the world by raising it to a new plane of knowledge and morality. Well, Wotan, remember, has finally had to accept that Siegmund cannot repair the harm that he, Wotan, has done. He's not a free hero, hence the need for Siegfried, who is truly free and who embodies that long-lost harmony between nature and human conduct, the idea Wagner got from Feuerbach and ultimately Rousseau. 
Naive and innocent in the sense of Rousseau's noble savage, Siegfried seems to be congenitally incapable of doing harm. Admittedly, he knocks his dad about a bit, but that's just an excess of adolescent high spirits. It goes with the territory. If you're a hero, you're almost certainly to suffer from a superabundance of energy and a deficiency of sensitivity. Sensitivity isn't part of the job description of a hero. But Siegfried's role is to restore the unity of humanity and nature, to reunite heaven and earth. As a sun god, which is what the legendary Siegfried was, he is endowed with the aura of immortality. Courage, fearlessness, and pure love are the qualities he possesses, and which are all that is needed to usher in this new era. As one early 20th century once writer once put it, the twilight of the gods is the dawn of the humanity of the future, over which neither gold nor power will reign, but only love. Well, Wotan disrupted that harmony by his crimes against nature. Remember, he tore off the branch of the world ash tree in the pursuit of wisdom. But Wotan's grandson Siegfried will make all well again. That was the plan anyway. Now, you may remember, too, that Bernard Shaw likened Siegfried to Mikhail Bakunin, the Russian anarchist, whom Wagner encountered at the height of the 1848-9 revolution. A fearless, ruthless freedom fighter dedicated to the sweeping away of the old order. For Wagner, Siegfried was beautiful, true, and noble. But here we come up against the problem that Wagner seems to have changed his mind. As you probably know, he broke off composition on the ring halfway through Siegfried, leaving his hero under the linden tree, communing with the birds. And he didn't resume composition for another 12 years, in 1869. But even before that break, Wagner was beginning to have second thoughts. In a famous letter to August Röckel, he said that when he embarked on the cycle, he had built up an optimistic world on Hellenic principles, believing that in order to realize such a world, it was only necessary for man to wish it. But then came the failure of the revolution and his reading of Schopenhauer, and he now felt, as he told Röckel, that he had grasped the very essence and meaning of the world itself in all its possible phases and had realized its nothingness. Well, you can see the problem. The mission his, zero, his hero Siegfried is embarked upon is pointless. It has no authenticity. What's the point of slaying dragons if such heroic ideals are illusory? But in the process of recognizing that Siegfried was not the redeemer the world needed, Wagner began to feel his way towards a more fundamental resolution. And that resolution was one that embraced the feminine spirit, without which, Wagner maintained, man was nothing. Hence the need for Brunhilde, who emerges as the true savior of humanity. This, I think, is Wagner's stroke of genius, that he takes us beyond the conventional concept of heroism to something much more personal, the feminine impulse, wisdom acquired through experience and suffering, compassionate love, as ultimately the highest worth. Now, the uh, construction of heroes owes much to the prevailing values of society, the society that creates them. If you think, for example, of the Edwardian era, uh, heroes were the great explorers or, or great climbers, men of courage, dauntless. Whereas, by contrast, in the more recent 20th and 21st centuries, heroes tend to be overpaid footballers, pop stars. Uh, and I think this tells us a great deal about the society that idolizes them. Now, Wagner's heroes appealed to Germans who were seeking a national identity, a strong common bond. The historian Thomas Carlyle, writing in the 1840s, so roughly the same sort of time as Wagner, a little before, Carlyle argues that salvation will come about not through a restructuring of society, but only through unquestioning trust in great men, as he inevitably put it, um, or heroes. Whereas for Wagner, I think, uh, we, we see this aspiration for a restructuring of society, but through the agency of heroes. In the ring, 
I think we have three heroes. The first, of course, is Siegmund, rugged, fugitive, outside society, burning with sexual desire, but unfortunately incestuous. We have uh, Siegfried, who of course is a sun god, supposedly a free, glorious hero, burnished and valiant, but also flawed, and he pays for his treachery. But with Brunhilde, we have surely the true hero or heroine of the tetralogy. Without women, Wagner is saying, men are incomplete. Now, Brunhilde unites heroism with compassion, and she breathes the spirit of compassionate love into the drama and shows how crucial it is to the envisaged new humanity of the future. For Wagner, I always feel that his, his heroism is, 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 a, kind of, is, is rather, a rather special blend of heroism because it's, it merges the concept of heroism with pacifism, at least in the later Wagner, by the time we get to Parsifal, uh, we see this much more nuanced, integrated idea of um, a heroism um, uh, blended with, with pacifism. It's possible to see, I think, this idea of a hero continued on from the ring, from Siegfried, who is many, in many ways flawed, to Parsifal, a much more um, successful hero in that sense, a more ideal hero, perhaps. Now, at the end of Götterdämmerung, as Brunhilde laments the death of Siegfried, she sings something very puzzling, and this is what she says. Never were oaths more nobly sworn, never were treaties kept more truly, never did any man love more loyally. And this is the man whose betrayal of her, handing her over to be raped by Gunther, while he himself carries off Gunther's sister, uh, caused the tragedy of his murder. Um, how, do we, how do we account for this? Well, Siegfried, the most loyal and unsullied of heroes, is not the Siegfried we've seen. And part of the reason for this almost certainly lies in that huge chronological gap between the composition of the poem between 1848 and 1852 and the music of Götterdämmerung, which wasn't written until 1872 some 20 years later. And over that period, the world had changed, as had Wagner's view of it. And the kind of hero he originally envisaged was no longer the type of being he now thought could bring about a better world, if indeed anybody could. So, should he have gone back and adjusted his storyline and dialogue? Well, if he had done, he would also have had to have changed a good deal of the music that he'd also composed. It's presumably a, a prospect too appalling to contemplate. But it's worth making the point, I think, that uh, heroism is not only about heroic deeds, it's also about the memory of them after the hero's death. Myth and literature are littered with examples of heroes whose moral decline begins as soon as they acquire power. Heroes flourish outside society, and at the point they enter it, as Siegfried arrives at the Gibschung court in Götterdämmerung, their heroic legitimacy begins to be compromised. So what Brunhilde is celebrating in that final eulogy is the Siegfried she loved, the untainted hero, not the Siegfried whose tragic downfall is the story of that final opera. Well, the problem of Siegfried, I think, also applies to the staging of the work, uh, because is, uh, it, it's, it's undeniable that Siegfried is, in part, um, a macho bully boy. He's, he's not sensitive in the modern new man sense of somebody who's in touch, a man in touch with his feminine side. And I understand that directors need to show that. I think what they've done over the recent decades is, is perfectly legitimate to show this, this side of Siegfried. But in the process, of course, there's a danger that one loses the more attractive aspects of Siegfried, his charm, his um, fearlessness, and that resplendent freedom Thomas Mann mentions. I think it's a very difficult balance to achieve, but I, I would like to see these more attractive qualities brought out alongside the less attractive ones. I think we would then see a more rounded character in Siegfried. The first thing that strikes us about Act One 
is probably not so much subtlety, however, that comes later. But what does strike us is that there's an awful lot of banging. Um, there's Mima's insistent hammering motif at the beginning, and then there's a clamor of Siegfried's two forging songs. So it's not surprising, perhaps, to learn that Wagner's work on the first act was punctuated by the best efforts of a neighboring tinsmith. Uh, this artisan had set up in the house opposite Wagner's in Zurich, and his hammer strokes became a kind of obligato accompaniment to, to the score and the composition. Well, at first, Wagner was in despair at having his work disturbed, but in a moment of fury, the banging gave him the idea for Siegfried's outburst of rage at Mima's bungling, and he sang through the passage in mock anger to his sister, and they laughed so much that he decided to put up with the distraction for the time being. Now, in the Covent Garden production by Keith Warner, we saw in the first act this crashed aeroplane, which I think is a symbol of brute technology, representing the incursion of the real world after the mythical world of the first two operas. In between the two scenes for Siegfried and Mima is the so-called riddle scene with the arrival of the magisterial wanderer. Now, the wanderer's music has a chorale-like nobility, which is contrasted with Mima's excitable jabbering. And their conversation naturally brings forth all those relevant leitmotifs. And as the wanderer finally leaves, telling Mima that his head will be forfeit to the one who knows no fear, Mima's own fear is very evident in the shaking of Tremolando's strings and a phantasmagoric transformation of motifs associated with the magic fire kind of um, sinister flickering in the woodwind, and the dragon. That is, you'll hear the, the bass and contrabass tubers prominent here. And this all builds to a terrifying climax, but emerging from the forest is none other than Siegfried, bullying and terrorizing his foster father with all his habitual charm. Siegfried's two forging songs, uh, the first of them, Nortung, Nortung, Neidlicher's Schwert, sung as he uh, stokes the fire by um, blowing the bellows, is characterized by downward octave leaps, Nortung, Nortung, matched by rising octaves in the orchestra. And this is an idea that Wagner very probably got from um, the heroic mode of the Ninth Symphony of his idol, Beethoven. The second forging song, um, Ho 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 Hai, is more um, graphic and gestural, and the, the declamation here is accompanied by mighty blows of, of the hammer. Well, whether one finds all this um, testosterone-filled energy exhilarating or verging on the tedious, I think is very much a matter of taste. But Pierre Boulez has made the very interesting point that there are scenes in Rheingold and even in Valkura that are essentially sequences of leader based on a dominant idea, as you get in Schubert or Schumann, which are articulated into the larger structure by recitatives or other means. I mean, some of these are obvious if you think back to Siegmund's Wintersturmer in Die Valkura, for example, or Lorger's um, aria in praise of women's beauty in Rheingold. But it's even more prevalent than that, and I think we can see it too in Siegfried, especially here in Act One, where these little songs or leader are sometimes more like folk songs. Uh, going back to the very opening of the opera, when the curtain eventually rises on Act One after quite a long orchestral introduction, we hear Mima complaining away and hammering on his anvil. And this motif, together with one suggesting him brooding thoughtfully, mm -hmm. 
And that motif also outlines the, uh, the motif of the ring, by the way, so we can guess what Mima is brooding about. This forms the material for virtually the whole of this section, so it's rather like a little lead. Then Siegfried comes bounding in. And his heroic motif dominates the next short section. Then Siegfried begins to berate Mima for not producing his sword. And we then hear a new thematic idea based on virile falling forths. And that goes on for some time. So it's another, uh, it's almost a self-contained lead in itself. And then Mima starts up his um, self-pitying little routine. Um, Out Zulander's kind, he, he sings, a whimpering babe, I brought you up. It's a song of which uh, Siegfried gets heartily sick, by the way. But again, this material is, is new, it, and it contains that repeated crushed note, which is called an akikatura, which makes him sound like a Jewish mother. So this is very much a self-contained little aria or song. And so it goes on throughout the act. So that's something to listen out for later on, the succession of little songs. And I think the really remarkable thing about this is the masterly way that Wagner binds all these songs together into a larger structure. And what Wagner's doing here, as Boulez also points out, is tracing a whole long German tradition and transforming it for his own purposes. Whether with these little leader or rondos or variations, he appropriates these forms for himself, reinventing them to fulfill new functions. Well, in the second act, we see more nuanced aspects of Siegfried. Uh, he's been brought by Mima to the dragon's cave at Neidhörle. Now, Siegfried may not quite yet have learnt to experience fear, but we do at least find him communing with nature. And here at last is obviously an attractive side to the character, at least one more in tune with sensibilities of our own time. It's true that uh, Siegfried rather blots his copybook at first. No sooner has he settled himself under the linden tree than he works himself up into a rather unpleasant little lather about the dwarf's appearance. Mima, he says, is misshapen and hunchbacked. He has droopy ears and roomy eyes, all anti-Semitic tropes, of course. But these are just some of the uh, filial compliments he pays. And then he calms down uh, for the music of the forest murmurs proper which is in an, an, an idyllic E major, rooted, as you can hear, over a sustained pedal note, like a, a rustic style with pentatonic colouring, that is, scales that are free of semitones, um, traditionally associated with um, innocent nature. And the woodwind calls we'll hear are now bird song, And these string tremolos are no longer threatening, but a warm cushion of sound.
that cushion of sound created by multiple divisions of instruments, again, as we had in, in the Valkyrie on Thursday, especially in Act One, uh, particularly cellos and violas, worth listening out for what they're doing, because often we hear those lower strings without the violins on top, um, creating these, these uh, wonderful musical fabrics. Now, Act Three is a huge contrast. Uh, the playful, ardent music we had at the close of Act Two, as Siegfried follows the woodbird towards the mountain, couldn't be more different from the mighty prelude to Act Three. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the point at which Wagner resumed composition after a long break in 1869. Actually, he initially abandoned Siegfried under the Linden between 1857, but then he returned to the work in 1864 to five and put the finishing touches to the second act then. But essentially, the third act started in 1869 was after a 12-year break, during which he'd composed <laughs> Tristan and Isolde and Die Meistersinger. Well, what's the difference here in Act 3? Immediately, we can hear the, re the renewed vigor of the writing, not to mention the compositional virtuosity of the highest order, and right from the first bar. This prelude to Act 3 is, in fact, one of Wagner's finest achievements, and it's actually a richly woven fabric of pre-existing material, a quasi-symphonic development of no fewer than nine motifs summoned from the repository of the cycle, just as Erda is summoned from her subterranean resting place. We've got time to hear a minute or two of this, so listen out for um, Erda's rising motif, and the descending one of Wotan's spear we've had that other day, which of course mirrors Erda's rising motif. Both of these are subjected to countless transformations, and they're all offset by this vigorous counterpoint of the Valkyrie's riding motif. The power of the ring can be heard, and the theme of the magic sleep, which is a wonderful um, cr chromatic descent. Uh, and also we'll hear powerful harmonic switches driving the prelude, which are derived from another chromatic motif of the wanderer, first heard in the riddle scene in Act One. So here's a bit of the prelude to Act Three, and um, see how many of those nine motifs you can spot. Well, how well did you do? <laughs> There's another chance later on. Now, the, the scene 
for the wanderer and erder that follows that prelude is quite breathtaking in its sublimity, with longer, more expansive themes than we've heard earlier in the opera, imparting a marvelously lyrical sweep to the music. It's, it's a very wonderful scene, but I want to end by saying something briefly about the final scene, which is the long duet for Siegfried and Brunhilde. Here you can see, of course, uh, Frieda Lieder and Max Lorenz. Um, now, it's, it, it is a love duet, um, but unlike the love duet we heard in, in The Valkyrie the other night, I think it's not erotic so much as sublime, an important distinction. I think there's a sense here that Siegfried and Brunhilde are not really responding to each other, but they're making grand statements of almost religious ecstasy. Their passion in, is on a very different level from that of ordinary humanity, perhaps on an archetypal level. And the second thing to say is that this duet is in three parts. First, Siegfried wakes Brunhilde, and there's this momentary kind of Freudian confusion as to the status of Brunhilde vis-a-vis -vis Siegfried's mother. Um, and a motif is associated with Sieglinde and her love for Siegmund is heard. Uh, but Brunhilde puts him straight. And most of the musical ideas are now new ones connected with Siegfried, Brunhilde, and their love for each other. And then in the second phase, when Siegfried passionately embraces her, Brunhilde retreats behind a barrier of shame and confusion, fearing that she's no longer worthy of the man who has won her. In the third section of this duet, we hear music familiar from the Siegfried Idyll. And here, Brunhilde suggests that she and Siegfried should complement each other like reflections in a stream, intimately related yet maintaining separate identities. But this proves to be the, but the crumbling of the last defense, and the lovers sink into each other's arms, and they pledge themselves one to the other with high-flown images that foreshadow the end of the gods in Götterdämmerung. Much of the imagery is aquatic here, and the music too surges like a series of unstoppable tidal waves. Clearly, that imagery is intended to be sexual too. Submitting to each other with wild abandon, the lovers sweep on to their ecstatic C major climax. Nothing can hold them back now. Of course, we share the thrill of the delirious passion they're experiencing, even though something tells us it can't last. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.